Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Uh, it's been a minute since I've popped on a live stream and I figured with this uh, blessed month of Ramadan that, um, you know, my goal is to get through the Quran, obviously. With this goal, I figured probably the best thing to do is, uh, you know, I ordered a new copy of the Sahih International Quran. So I figured what I do is I just host this uh, live chat and anybody that uh, uh, is a non-Muslim that's interested in Islam or just has some um, questions, uh, they're, they're most welcome to come up here. And in the meantime, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start from Surah Al-Fatiha and then I'm going to just keep going down into the Quran. As, uh, I'm going to be reading it aloud in English. I know a lot of folks are doing um, they're doing the seat of the Rasul, they're doing a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, I figured the best thing is obviously to go to the Quran and naturally I'm going to try to add some of my own personal reflections. Again, I'm not a scholar, so the things that I mentioned, they're not opinions in any way, shape or form whatsoever. Rather, it's just my own personal reflection on uh, the things that I'm reading. And as guests kind of come on in here with this open chat, you know, I'm, I'm happy to host them and then answer any questions that I have knowledge of. Um, so let me just kick it off. So Surah Al-Fatiha starts in, in the name of Allah, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. Uh, all praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. Sovereign of the day of recompense. It is you we worship and you we ask for help. Guide us to the straight path, path of those upon whom you have bestowed favor and not of those who have earned your anger or of those who are astray. So right off the bat in Islam, we're starting with mercy. We're starting with compassion. And the one thing that I really love about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he is endlessly uh, merciful, entirely merciful, especially merciful, where it's like when I think of uh, myself, even when I give to charity and when somebody's just kind of asking me for things, naturally, you know, you have a, a natural inclination to say, yeah, absolutely. And then from there, um, if the person just keeps perpetually asking you about stuff, you're going to get really, really tired of them asking you about what they're asking you. So Alhamdulillah, you know, we worship uh, the only deity worthy of worship, which never gets tired of us making dua, making supplication to him and asking him for aid, asking him from his endless bounty and from his mercy. And to me, that makes me feel really, really good. Um, one thing, as I was also kind of reflecting on the um, this particular surah, you know, it's a, a, an incredibly powerful du'a, and we recite it uh, many times during the day. And the beautiful thing about this surah to me is you're asking to be led down this straight path, but it's a path to him. So it's not just like a path to, you know, uh, somebody, some, some type of materialistic thing. And one of the things in Islam, we're encouraged to seek out knowledge. We're encouraged to um, better ourselves and enlighten ourselves. So when I think of uh, the, the particular verse, you know, Salat al-Mustaqim, uh, to me, that's a form of elevation. So you're asking to be elevated and to be brought up. Um, but that comes with some responsibility, right? So the way that I personally reflect on it is, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is increasing you by elevating you to a greater height, then what that's going to do in turn is now you're going to be held accountable to all the things that you are newly exposed to. So let's say you're acquiring new knowledge, you're seeing the world through a different lens, and you are um, aware now of some of the things that you're doing. And you're aware of the things that you need to stay away from. And the more knowledge that someone has, especially like, say, someone who's like a scholar or someone who is extremely close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then um, if they were to commit some type of uh, sin or if they were to commit some type of irresponsible act, then to me, um, this person has a, a greater distance to fall down to the ground and it's going to hurt a lot more. So the way that I see it is uh, the more that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens your eyes and opens your heart and opens your mind, the more that you're going to be held um, to account, which is uh, rightfully so. And again, he's he gives us an, an example here, the path of those whom you have bestowed your favor and not of those who have earned your anger or of those who are astray. 
So we have a tell sign that there are people that make uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's anger uh, is going to be bestowed upon them. And there's also going to be people that are going to be led astray. And naturally, that's the whole idea, right? The idea is that uh, we're put here for a test and we have to be kind of incentivized by either reward or punishment. If you really kind of look down to the root of what makes human beings human beings, you know, why do you go to your job or why do you... Uh, not park your car in a place where you're not supposed to park your car. It's because it's a system of reward and a system of punishment. All right. So moving on to the next one. This is Surah Al-Baqarah, which is uh, the second chapter of the Quran. And by the way, this isn't the second um, revelation in order. So the beautiful thing about the Quran is it's it's not a chronological book. You know, Alhamdulillah, uh, the Prophet ﷺ gave it to us and ordered it for us in this particular way by the direction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But um, it's, it, it is not something where you have to read it, you know, from the beginning until the end. There is no end to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it goes, Alif Lam Mim. This is the book about which there is no doubt a guidance for those conscious of Allah who believe in the unseen, establish prayer, and spend out of what we have provided for them, and who believe in what has been revealed to you, O Muhammad, and what was revealed before you, and of the hereafter, they are certain, in faith. Those are upon right guidance from their Lord, and it is those who are successful. So there's a pretty bold claim right at the beginning here. Um, the Quran right here is claiming that it has it's a it's a book that is uh, upon no doubt right, and it's a, a guidance for those that are God conscious. So if you consider yourself to be someone who is you know spiritual, because uh, just this last Saturday I was out um, in a in an open area and there was a person, a beautiful woman, um, you know spiritually, and who was talking about uh, how she is a uh, someone who believes in Santeria. And what's interesting is they're kind of like universalists. So they believe in um, all paths leading to God and that things can be blended together in order to get uh, a result. And although they may that may seem kind of cool, um, at the end of the day, there can only be one ultimate truth uh, and one ultimate reality. And from an Islamic perspective, we believe that that is Islam. So you have to be God conscious and you have to understand that God is not going to just create stuff without purpose. And he's going to send guidance and he's going to send messengers so that you can receive his message. Uh, all that he requires or all that he asks of you is to have a sincere heart and to um, be sincere with yourself and be honest. So uh, the Quran, we believe, is the ultimate form of guidance, uh, which guides us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his way, his deen. So for people that are God conscious, you know, if you don't have a copy of the Quran, I highly recommend that um, you pick up a copy. If you need a copy, just please email me and I'll, I'm happy to send one over your way. Uh, that way that um, as we go through this uh, blessed month of Ramadan, if you can catch up to me uh, in my reading, then I'm happy to kind of have a, a little bit of a side by side book study with you. So. It says, who believe in the unseen, establish prayer and spend out of what we have provided for them. So obviously, if you're somebody that believes in God, you're believing in the unseen, right? God's not something that you can touch, that you can feel. Um, you can perceive the existence of God. You can conceptualize uh, certain elements of God. But if you're someone who is like, no, I need to have some type of vision or I need to have some type of, you know, touch, smell, taste and so on. You're just kind of um, you're approaching the problem all wrong. And, you know, I was a victim of that very early on during my atheist days. So uh, it says here, believe in the unseen and establish prayer. And now um, just something that I see as a commonality across uh, all folks that uh, have various religions. Typically, all of us believe in the unseen, right? So we believe in like either angels or we believe in some spiritual force or we believe in. So it's addressing those people. So who believe in the unseen and spend out of what we have provided for them. Now, the we here that's used obviously is a royal we or a, a plural of majesty. It's not saying that there's some type of duplicity to God or anything like that. So just similar to how like 
a queen or a king or somebody in their kingdom is saying like, oh, we have sent our messenger or um, this is our kingdom and there's only one king. It's kind of like that. So, uh, and who believe in what has been revealed to you, O Muhammad, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and what was revealed before you. And of the hereafter, they are certain. So obviously there was revelation that came before the Quran. And now what the Quran is basically positioning itself from just this one verse is the people that believed before you also believed in Allah. They also believed in that one deity, even though their revelation was different in the sense of either its delivery or its content, right? So we have like the, the Torah, we have the Zabur, we have the uh, Injil, and then we have the Quran. So we believe as Muslims that all of the messengers were in fact Muslim. So they all believed in one deity worthy of worship, and they all submitted their will to this deity. So by definition, um, they were Muslim. Okay. So uh, those are upon right guidance from their Lord, and it is those who are successful. So obviously, we're all trying to attain some type of success in this world, but the ultimate success is to uh, earn the pleasure of this deity or of this creator uh, known as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So indeed, those who disbelieve, it is all the same for them. Whether you warn them or do not warn them, they will not believe. So immediately he's giving us the um, a little bit of psychology of people that we talk to, right? So I'm sure that many of us have heard the phrase or the saying like, oh, the two taboo things that we should never talk about are like religion and politics. Well, in all reality, um, we should be talking about these things because they impact our society a great deal, especially religion. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us a little bit or giving us a glimpse of the psychology of a disbelievers, meaning if you talk to them, even if it's a sincere uh, conversation that you're trying to have with them, if they truly are upon some type of disbelief, then um, especially like, a, you know, it runs the, the gamut. There's people that are just like, oh, okay, you know, I'm a reasonable person and I'm just looking for some type of um, proof or reasoning, you know, logical reasoning to come to this conclusion. I have to collect a bunch of golden nuggets and then ultimately I'll make my decision. And then there's the other type of person that said, no, I require seeing angels and people rising from the dead right in front of me. And why hasn't anybody returned from the grave type of disbelief, right? And everything and anything in between. Okay. So it gives us the psychology of um, these types of disbelievers. Those who disbelieve, it's all the same for them. Whether you warn them or do not warn them, they will not believe. Allah has set a seal upon their hearts and upon their hearing and over their vision is a veil. And for them is a great punishment. So... I know at first glance, uh, especially I know the first time that I read the Quran, I was like, eh, well, doesn't it kind of seem like the situation is fixed? But rather, it's a consequence of their disbelief. So if somebody is perpetually upon their ego and perpetually upon their desire to not want to change their ways, no matter what, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps increasing them in that way. But if they were to just be sincere with themselves and sincere with their quest for truth, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would open their hearts, right? Because remember, the revelations start with uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, which is uh, in the name of God, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. And if you believe in this merciful God, then there's no reason for him to um, keep punishing you if you're being sincere, right? So uh, when, when I was on my quest and I was an atheist, um, basically ego was getting in the way. And it wasn't until I let my ego flush out that um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up my heart to see things from a different perspective and, and what a blessing it is, right? So it says Allah has set a seal upon their hearts and upon their hearing and over their vision is a veil, and for them is a great punishment. So once again, reward and punishment. So if you're upon this disbelief and upon this arrogance um, and you persist in your ways, then you're gonna receive a great punishment. And of the people, and of the people are some who say, we believe in Allah and the last day, but they are not believers. So here you have an identification of a hypocrite, right? So there are people on this planet 
which I'm sure that you've had dealings uh, with some type of hypocrisy in your life. You know, somebody said, yeah, okay, sure, no matter what, blah, blah, blah. And then either they didn't show up or they didn't hold up their end of the deal or something like that. So basically what's happening here is we're, we're being exposed to yet another type of psychology, which is uh, hypocrisy. Uh, they think to deceive Allah and those who believe, but they deceive not except themselves and perceive it not. So interestingly enough, um, they think that they're ahead of the game, right? They think that they're getting some type of victory from this stuff, but in reality, hypocrisy doesn't win ever. Um, I know that there is uh, an old saying of basically, you know, uh, dirt rises to the top kind of thing. So usually what happens with hypocrisy is it gets exposed some type of way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is assuring uh, these people that if you try to be a hypocrite, you're not fooling anybody but yourselves. So you may think that you're getting some type of benefit, but at the end of the day, um, when when the final account comes, you know, you're going to be in, in really big trouble. And that's not saying that they're going to have this like smooth sailing form of existence in their life, because obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can administer punishment in this world and in the next. It says in their heart is a disease. So Allah has increased their disease. And obviously the disease that he's referencing here is that hypocrisy. And for them is a painful punishment because they habitually used to lie. So um, lying is a, it's, it's a really staining and damning thing in a sense where, um, I don't know if you guys have ever had somebody in your life where you just knew to kind of always take whatever they said with a grain of salt. And then eventually what happens is you just completely avoid that person. So um, it is a very uh, a diseaseful thing. And naturally, when some, it, it's very interesting that the Quran uses this uh, terminology of a disease because when somebody is diseased, you kind of want to stay away from them. You know, you want to help them to whatever capacity that you can, but you yourself don't want to get sick. So um, if you hang, you know, again, I know I'm kind of really terrible with these like cheesy old sayings, but it's like if you hang around a barbershop, you're going to get a haircut eventually. So if you hang around people that are perpetual liars, you're going to start building these habits. If you hang around people that are hip, uh, hypocritical, then you're going to start picking up those habits and you're going to think that you're getting some type of gain. Okay. And then um, next verse, it says, and when it is said to them, uh, do not cause corruption on the earth, they say we are but reformers. Now, this is pretty interesting, especially, especially with the um, social situation that's going on today, socially political situation, right? People are saying, no, this needs to happen because it's good, right? And they think that they're doing good, but it, it's not true, right? They're causing more and more corruption and they're just concealing their hypocrisy, uh, typically either for self gain or some type of like, uh, status achievement or something who knows right it can it can run the gamut but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala identifies these people and um lets us know to you know be wary of that and obviously not to become that unquestionably it is they who are the corruptors but they perceive it not so there you have it you know they're leaving chaos in their wake and they think that they're doing this uh wonderful thing but in the end it's it's not um remember uh kind of a really old saying, but if you want to see change, you have to start changing yourself first, and then you're going to be able to, to see the change um, be kind of applied towards the generala. So uh, let's see here. It says, uh, and when it is said to them, believe as the people have believed, they say, should we believe as the foolish have believed? Unquestionably, it is they who are the foolish, but they know it not. So... <laughs> It's really interesting, but in the field of Dawa, uh, especially when I'm talking to people of, uh, that are of a very high intellectual capacity, um, they think that they're know-it-alls, right? And they, they start associating their wits or their smarts, um, and they try to obfuscate the question at hand when they can't just face it very, very simply, because Islam is very, very simple, right? Belief in one God, belief in all the messengers, including their message. Uh, which is to believe in that one God. So um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala labels them as 
um, foolish. So they try to make other people look foolish when it's they who are foolish. And naturally, in the if you believe in God, you're going to believe in attributes of all powerful, all knowledgeable, and so on. You know, the things that define a God and, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines himself in the Quran. So if these guys think that they're in some way, shape, or form smarter than uh, Allah Almighty, um, that's probably the, the silliest thing I've ever heard in my life, right? But these these types of people do exist, unfortunately. Uh, and when they meet those who believe, they say, we believe. But when they are alone with their evil ones, they say, indeed, we are with you. We were only mockers. So there you have it, the hypocrisy between uh, public and private. But Allah mocks them and prolongs them in their transgressions while they wander blindly. So... Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sealing their vision. He's sealing their hearts. And they think that they're they're onto something, either living a good life by getting some type of riches or some type of rewards. Uh, but what's happening is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically just allowing them to just keep going in their ways so they accumulate sin. Uh, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah to everybody that has joined and uh, welcome in. The link is pinned up there. And I welcome all non-Muslims that are interested in um, chatting about Islam. So just come join me in the meantime. I'm just going to keep reading from the Quran. So, but Allah mocks them and prolongs them in their transgressions while they wander blindly. Those who are the ones, uh, excuse me, those are the ones who have purchased error in exchange for guidance. So their transaction has bought them no profit, nor were they guided. So obviously they're sacrificing uh, their hereafter for uh, the material of today. And in the in the grand scheme of things right the grand scheme of things um the hereafter is is uh everlasting so today is just a it's like a blink of an eye it probably even less right so they're they're making a massive massive sacrifice and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it a transaction here um very interesting that the word transaction is used because it requires agreement right? It requires agreement. So somebody is actually agreeing to their method. They're agreeing to the way that they're conducting themselves and they feel okay with it. So a um, very interesting choice of words. Their example is that of one who kindled a fire, but when it illuminated what was around him, Allah took away their light and left them in darkness so they could not see. Deaf, dumb, and blind, so they will not return to the right path. Or is it like a rainstorm from the sky within which is darkness, thunder, and lightning? They put their fingers in their ears against the thunderclaps in dread of death. But Allah is encompassing of the disbelievers. So to me, um, the way that I see it is, and, and I'm sure, I'm actually, I'm 100% I'm confident in saying this. I am positive that every single individual receives some type of a mental nudge through their life, whether it be like a gut feeling or whether it be some type of personal experience or something like that. And it's identified as like this loud event, right? Um, that person is actively choosing to ignore their innate disposition to want to identify God right? They may say, they may say all sorts of different reasons for what it is, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us this um, analogy where they're putting their fingers in their ears against the thunderclaps, meaning that they're getting these nudges, but they're actively trying to ignore them. And these nudges are loud, right? I don't know if you, if you guys have ever experienced some type of thunderclap or what have you um, it, to be in a thunderstorm, but it is um, extremely humbling. I remember that I was in Europe uh, when I was very, very, I was like in a thunderstorm and the lightning was like super close, right? And when that thing clapped, I mean, you could feel the gravity just push you down. It was um, absolutely incredible. So uh, the lightning almost snatches away their sight. Every time it lights the way for them, they walk therein. But when darkness comes over them, they stand still and if Allah had willed, he could have taken away their hearing and their sight. Indeed, Allah is over all things competent. O mankind, worship your Lord, who created you and those before you, that you may become righteous. So here we have a, uh, a direct message to mankind. Okay. And what is the message? The message is worship your Lord. And then he gives us 
what uh, a glimpse of what he wants from us. He wants us to become righteous. So you have this all merciful, all powerful God who wants you to become righteous. And that to me is an amazing thing, right? Uh, if why would why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not want good? And this often happens when I talk to people that are disbelievers. They think, you know, how could a God exist? How could all this stuff, you know, take place, all these tragedies and blah, 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 blah. And obviously the Quran covers this stuff a little bit later, which we'll touch base on. But at the same time, we you have at the very beginning, not even 21 verses in, uh, in the second chapter, you have your first response as to what does God want from you? And he wants you to become righteous, right? And he wants you to do that uh, by worshiping him. So the path to righteousness is to actually worship your Lord. He who made for you the earth, a bed spread out and the sky, a ceiling and sent down from the sky rain and brought forth thereby fruits as provision for you. So do not attribute to Allah equals while you know that there is nothing similar to him. So again, we have that innate disposition that there is nothing similar to God. We know it within ourselves. Um, and he, he cautions us uh, not to bring these types of equals, whether it be our own desires or whether it be some other type of you know idolatry in, in any other way, right? And he tells us that he uh, he gives us a, a, a another glimpse of, of his blessings, right? So the blessings of having various types of food and the blessings of having the ability to explore the landscape that he provided for us. And uh, likewise, he gave us the blessings of a ceiling of, of that sky um, that functions as a canopy uh, and that protects us from all sorts of things. So it goes on to say, and if you are in doubt about what we have sent down to you, i.e. the Quran upon our servant, which is a Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then produce a surah like it. The, produce a surah the like thereof and call upon your witnesses or supporters other than Allah if you should be truthful. So here is the first challenge to people that are upon disbelief. So if they think that this message is in fact not from Almighty God, then there's a challenge for you to produce a surah like it. Um, and you can call upon anyone you want. Now, obviously there's criteria, uh, and this is more of a challenge for the Arabs, and uh, what I would believe is, a, is an indefinite challenge, but it was very much so geared towards the uh, uh, linguistic masters of the Arabic language at the time. Okay. Uh, but if you do not, and you will never be able to, then fear the fire whose fuel is people and stones prepared for disbelievers. So uh, here's a form of, of reassertion. So if you don't, okay, meaning that you can't get to that, to honor that challenge, and you won't, right? So he's telling you straight up, you won't. So very, very plainly, Till this day, if anybody could reproduce something like this, uh, reproduce a surah like this, this Quran would have been disproven. And, uh, you know, th there would be no Islam uh, because it would violate one of the conditions. So obviously we believe that this is a, a, a miraculous book. We believe this is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. And if, it, if the speech of Almighty God can be disproven, then um, there, th this is not in fact from God, uh, and it is it is man made. Okay, so, and give good tidings to those who believe and do righteous deeds, that they will have gardens in paradise beneath which rivers flow. Whenever they are provided with a provision of fruit therefrom, they will say, "This is what we were provided with before," and it is given to them in likeness. And they will have therein purified spouses, and they will abide therein eternally. Okay, so remember that system of like reward and punishment. So it was talking about punishment first. Actually, first it proposed a challenge. Then it was talking about punishment. Now it's giving you the, the reward, right? So it's saying, and give good tithings to those who believe and do righteous deeds. So remember, Las Panta said, I want you guys to become righteous. The way that you become righteous is by worshiping me. And then there's going to be good tithing, uh, tidings to those who believe and do righteous deeds. And uh, the, the interesting thing about this is that there needs to be some type of relatability, right? So when somebody's giving you a reward, if I were to 
um, if you were a person that like never tasted honey and I go, man, I've got this incredible batch of honey. You're not going to believe it. It's so good. It's like the best honey you've ever had in your life. It's the best thing in the world, blah, blah, blah. You would have absolutely no idea of what I'm talking about. And you would not be incentivized to its maximum capacity. So what a lost pound on that does here is actually pretty profound obviously, because uh, he's God, it says here that um, you will say, it says they will say, meaning me, you, and everybody else that is uh, righteous, inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of the righteous. This is what we were provided with before, and it is given to them in likeness. So it'll be similar, similar to what you're receiving today. Not in a sense of a strawberry is a strawberry. But rather the sense, this is again, my own personal reflection, I'm not a scholar, but rather in the sense of when you were to bite into a strawberry, the experience and the pleasure and the sensation of what you would get from biting into a strawberry, you would get something of the like in Jannah and obviously more, okay? Because we believe that, um, that it's going to be a never ending good tiding and a never ending reward. So it, it you can't be at a standstill. You can't get bored in paradise. That's just throw it out the window. The concept doesn't exist, right? So that experience of biting into that strawberry to me is what we would get the likeness of. So I can imagine the first time you tried a strawberry and hopefully you, you really like strawberries. Otherwise it would be the first time that you ever tried a fruit that you were just like, wow, this is just incredible. And I remember feeling that type of sensation uh, when I tried dragon fruit from the first time. So I was in Thailand and I tried dragon fruit. And when I bit into this thing, I was like, I have really been missing out in my life. This is incredible, right? So uh, that is exactly what I think uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is um, referencing when he's, when he's talking to that. But Allahu alam, and obviously check with the scholars. So indeed, Allah is not timid to present an example that of a mosquito or what is smaller than it. And those who have believed know that it is the truth from their Lord. But as for those who disbelieve, they say, what did Allah intend by this uh, as an example? He misleads many hereby and guides many thereby. And he misleads not except the defiantly disobedient. Okay, so we have some conditions, okay? And we have um, a small uh, example of a mosquito. So to me, the example of a mosquito is that he can create anything big and small. And then we are at such a, um, such a loss when it comes to creation that we can't even duplicate a simple mosquito. We can't create a fly. We can't create... Uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but um, I for sure have. If you're ever watching a movie, it's the alien or whatever kind of creation, imaginative thing that we create always has some semblance to something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already created. So if it's like a crab creature, it, it has the semblance of a crab. If it's like a two-legged walking humanoid type thing, it has a semblance of that. Like human beings cannot get original with their creation. We can simply just like copy something that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or draw inspiration from something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already put forth. So to me, um, this is another tell sign that there is a creator out there. Uh, and it's a, it's a very small but profound sign. Okay, so then obviously the, the challenge is like, why not? Why don't you guys originate? If you think that you're the creator or you think that the earth created itself or something to that extent, and you really believe in your science, why is it that you can't create not even the wing of a fly? Or in this example, he uses a mosquito or, or what is smaller, right? Uh, okay, so then um, he goes on and says, uh, what did Allah intend by this as an example? He misleads many thereby and guides many thereby, and he misleads not except the defiantly disobedient. So here's another condition. The condition is if you are perpetually and defiantly disobedient, meaning you're, you're perpetually and in, in, uh, you're following your arrogance in perpetuity and you, you are just you see the signs plain as day. I'm talking like someone says, Hey, the sky is blue. And you're like, no, 
It is not. It's green. You're a liar and it's green. Okay. Unless you have some type of like a medical condition, like you're colorblind or you have some type of an excuse, you know, we can explore that from the person you'd ask it like, Hey dude, are you colorblind? Or is there something medically going on with you where you're seeing things like blues as greens and stuff? Cause it exists. Okay. That's not what I'm talking about. That's a unique situation. I'm talking about somebody who is actually being defiantly disobedient. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states right here, defiantly disobedient. So they see it for what they see it. They see an apple for an apple. They see a, a pear for a pear. And they're saying that's not an apple and that's not a pear. Okay. So if you meet that condition, which is bad, then he's going to mislead you. So that is the consequence. The consequence is your defiant disobedience is leading into that, um, leading into that uh, uh, misguidance. Okay. So, and again, remember, he says it's transactional. So if you stop the transaction of disobedience, boom, he's going to, he's going to lead you to what's correct. Okay. All right. Uh, carrying on, it says who break the covenant of Allah after contracting it and sever that which Allah has ordered to be joined and cause corruption on earth. It is those who are the losers. So we have more conditions, right? If you have a covenant with God uh, after contracting it, meaning you say, like, I believe, right? Now you have a covenant. Um, if you say, uh, uh, by God, or I swear to God, I'm going to do this. You've created a covenant. Like, I swear to God, I'm going to go and uh, go for a walk on Tuesday at 8.15. If you don't go for a walk Tuesday at 8.15, you know, a.m. or whatever you said, then you have essentially broken a covenant, right? So, in my own personal reflection, the best way to avoid something like that is don't swear, don't swear by God. Just say, I'm going to go and I'm going to go for a walk at 815. And if, if nothing happens of it, you know, obviously say I'm going to go for a walk at 815, God willing. Okay. That way that if you're still alive, if God still permits you to be breathing, then you can go for a walk at 815, no harm, no foul. Now, obviously there's going to be severities of covenants and stuff like that. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty because uh, I'm not at that level and everybody's situation is unique, right? So this is just, again, my own personal reflection. So after contracting it and, and, and sever that which Allah has ordered to be joined and cause corruption on earth. So, hey, um, don't cause corruption on earth. It's those who are the losers. So now we have, again, two things. We have winners and we have losers. Obviously, we want to be part of the winners. Winning feels really, really good. Losing feels terrible, and I can only imagine uh, just how terrible it must feel on the day of judgment, especially when you're seeing all these other people winning, and then now you're one of the losers. Like, that's a pretty grave thing, but I'm not a morbid guy, meaning, like, I really, I, I'm hopeful and believe in positive, and I have a positive mental attitude towards things, so um, I function and gravitate more towards reward, and then obviously there's things that I you know, punishment does its own deal on me too, right? Like you don't want to lose your job. You don't want to lose a family member. You don't want to lose any of that stuff, right? Okay. So carrying on, it says, how can you disbelieve in Allah when you were lifeless and he brought you to life? Then he will cause you to die. Then he will bring you back to life. And then to him, you will be returned. Okay. So there's a question being posed here. And the question is, um, he's giving you the sequence of what's going to happen. Okay. So at one point in time, you didn't exist. Then he brought you into existence or brought you to life. And then he caused you to die. Right. So, uh, really kind of funky insight here, but something that I, again, personally reflect on is nobody really blames the angel of death for death. Right. Uh, you don't even blame God for death per se. You'll blame like the car accident or you'll blame like the drug overdose. You'll be like, oh yeah, this guy OD'd or this guy had a heart attack or this guy had this or this guy had that, right? But those are just mechanisms of being summoned back. But it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that dictates this person is going to pass away at this particular time uh, for this particular reason, right? So again, it's staying true to, and it's giving you who has authority over life and death. Not only is it giving you who has authority over life and death, but he's giving you who has authority over life, death, and afterlife. Okay. So it's, that's, it's all there in just that one, uh, just that one verse. So this is again, verse 28 um, in chapter two. 
Okay. Uh, carrying on 29. It is he who created for you all that which is on the earth, then directed himself to the heaven, his being above all creation and made them seven heavens. And he is knowing of all things. Okay. Um, uh, verse 30 and mention, O Muhammad, when your Lord, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mention, O Muhammad, O, uh, when your Lord said to the angels, indeed, I will make upon the earth a successive authority. They said, will you place upon it one who causes corruption therein and sheds blood while we exalt you with praise and declare your perfection? Okay. So now here's a, you know, a good thought exercise, right? Do angels have free will? Okay. Well, it seems that they have some type of limited will where they are able to pose questions. Okay. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the angels... Uh, the, he's having a a, a, um, a dialogue, right? And this was almost their own kind of um, uh, intuition or their own thought process. And they posed a question. So uh, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, indeed, I know that which you do not know. Okay. So there is a limitation of what the angels know. So what that tells me is, and again, I'm not a scholar, <clears throat> what that tells me is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given angels a type of knowledge and they can work with that knowledge that was given to them, but they do not have all knowledge. They do not have access to the unseen. They still need to have whatever that knowledge is, call it like an intrinsic knowledge, um, uh, enhanced upon to some capacity. So what, what do I mean by that? Or like, what's like the closest um kind of thing that we can see in our world you know in our material world with that stuff okay so here's here's how i relate it if there's a bee like a worker bee going around the beehive and doing its thing right it's not like the queen bee taught that bee what it needs to do it just intrinsically knew what it needed to do so that knowledge had to have come from somewhere it doesn't come from some like DNA strand or some like whatever uh, uh, physical mechanism. It, there is some type of a spiritual mechanism that this is what you're going to do. This is the set of instructions that you're going to follow. So that bee goes out, pollinates, gathers nectar, brings it back. And, you know, now it's kind of being recycled through the colony and whatever, which way I'm not a bee expert. Right. But I just see the, the order in things. And in the same way that there's order in those bees, there is a, from what I can gather from this exchange, there is an order in the, um, in the back and forth between the level of an angel and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God almighty. Right. So they still have things that they don't know. So, uh, carrying on 31 and he taught Adam the names all of them then he showed them to the angels and said inform me of the names of these if you are truthful they said exalted are you we have no knowledge except what you have taught us okay well there you go indeed it is you who is the knowing the wise so the source of knowledge the source of no knowing the source of wisdom is God and he bestowed that onto the angels. Great. He said, O oh Adam, inform them of their names. And when he had informed them of their names, he said, did I not tell you that I know the unseen aspects of the heavens and the earth? And I know what you reveal and what you have concealed. Okay. So that tells me that human beings have a particular knowledge that if we don't reveal it, the angels don't have access to it, okay? So unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals it to the angels or if we say something, then they get um, they get access to it. So the way that I kind of personally reflect on it is, let's say you're making a dua, you're making a supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears you, but there's probably some form of messaging uh, angels or something that delivers special dua, like when I think of like making salawat and salam to the Prophet, salam. Okay. Especially when you're going to Umrah and you're, you know, it's not, there are messenger angels that are delivering messages. Okay. Um, and they acquire that knowledge by you saying it out loud. 
So your supplication is obviously heard by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it's also heard by those angels as well. Um, okay. And it says, and mention when we said to the angels, prostrate before Adam, so they prostrated except for Iblis. Okay, now here we have a categorical difference. So we have the angels and we have Iblis. So Iblis, uh, for the non-Muslims, uh, Iblis is basically uh, Satan. So it's Shaitan or Satan. Uh, he refused and was arrogant and became of the disbelievers. So we have another categorical distinction here. Iblis actually refused, and it shows you a characteristic of arrogance. And if you notice so far, the common thread with people that are disbelievers is arrogance. Okay. And now you have the source of that arrogance being uh, Satan. And a couple kind of nuggets that I really encourage you to reflect on. So if, if there was no Satan before Satan, who the heck was inspiring him to be arrogant? Nobody. Nobody. He was literally so friggin' arrogant that he did not need any type of arrogantal, whatever, inspiration. Rather, he was just following his own desires. Okay, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is you have a categorical difference between uh, angels and Satan. So you have uh, Iblis who has the, the capacity to disobey God. Okay. Meaning if God were to have instructed him to prostrate here, okay, he gave him an, a choice. He gave him a choice, prostrate or don't. The angels followed immediately. So they do not have any type of ability to disobey God, period. Meaning they got the set of instructions to prostrate. They were told to prostrate. They prostrated. Iblis refused and was arrogant and became of the disbelievers. So another key golden nugget. Again, when you're reading the Quran, try to do it with the Buddha when you're doing these types of reflections. Um, he became of the disbelievers, which means at some point he was a believer. At some point he was somebody who believed and prostrated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Um, and we know that he's not from the angelic realm. So he is not, a, he is not one of the angels because according to the Quran, it is representing him as categorically different. Okay. Then it says he refused and was arrogant and became of the disbelievers. And we said, Oh, Adam, dwell you and your wife in paradise and eat therefrom in ease and abundance from wherever you will. But do not approach this tree, lest you be among the wrongdoers. Okay, so here's the condition. You can go hang out. You can go do whatever you want. Just don't go near this tree. Okay, and if you, if you notice something in Islam, we have a very uh, serious stance about approaching wrongdoing. So, like, if you're approaching something that you shouldn't be, Back to that old situation where if you go to a barbershop, you're going to get a haircut. Or excuse me, if you hang around a barbershop, eventually you're going to get a haircut. If you go and you're hanging around certain things that are bad for you, like you you may not be a drinker or you may not smoke. But if you go hang out with people that drink and smoke, eventually, eventually you're going to try it. Okay. And then eventually you want to lead to two and blah, 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 because your sense of innocence is going to fade away. So look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here. He says, do not approach mm, this tree. It doesn't matter which one he pointed to. That's not what's important. It's not like he says, don't go near an apple tree or whatever. He just says, mm, this tree, meaning your curiosity is going to now start building about this particular tree, whatever this tree was. Okay. But point being is he set a criteria of what not to do now. Carrying forward, it says, but Satan caused them to slip out of it and remove them from the condition in which uh, in which they had been. And we said, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, go down all of you as enemies to one another. And you will have upon the earth a place of settlement and provision for a time. Then Adam received from his Lord some words. Okay, let me backtrack just a little bit because, again, I had like a personal reflection. Okay. 
It says, Satan caused them to slip out of it and remove them from that condition in which they had been. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, go down all of you as enemies to one another. So you have a clear definition of an enemy and you have a clear condition of what this enemy has. This enemy has a quality of ding, 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 arrogance. Okay. So if you are an arrogant individual, you are following the enemy and you are behaving like the enemy and you will be treated as the enemy. Okay, meaning that you're going to get punished, right? Because we believe that Iblis is ultimately going to get one of the worst punishments ever in existence, and it will be specifically reserved for him. So arrogance is our enemy. Now that goes with anything in life, anything. If you are uh, approaching your job, your spouse, your family, your whatever, with arrogance, you are following the footsteps of Iblis, Okay. So it's not just about your uh, uh, disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, it is now a condition of how you're approaching um, you're approaching anything situationally uh, as you're living your daily life, right? Okay. Uh, it continues. It says, Then Adam received from his Lord some words, and he accepted his repentance. So Adam, uh, Adam alayhi salam, Adam, he made uh, a plea for repentance. So we have a another a door, another opening for us, right? And it shows us what human beings do, the ones that are believers and the ones that are truthful and the ones that are truly sorry. So he turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he asked for forgiveness. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you he accepted his repentance, okay? So you immediately had an answer right there. And again, it's attributing to his... Uh, mercy. It says, indeed, it is he who is the accepting of repentance, the merciful. So um, one of one of his names is uh, uh, Ghafur Rahim, right? So uh, two, two names there for you. Um, and uh, the so the accepting of repentance and the merciful. Now, uh, at the web, I believe, is um, the accepting of repentance, but don't quote me on that. I'm a little brain fried today. Uh, okay, so we said, uh, and it continues, we said, go down from it, all of you, and when guidance comes to you from me, whoever follows my guidance, there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. So here's your, your golden ticket. Here's your get out of jail free card. Your get out of jail free card is locate the guidance, obviously, follow the guidance, and as long as you're following the guidance, Whoever follows that guidance, you have a guarantee. So when you're talking to, uh, you know, um, if you're a Christian out there or, you know, anybody else that thinks that they have some type of a guarantee and you're approaching someone who is a Muslim and you think that Muslims do not have a guarantee. No, the guarantee is right there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us uh, straight, straight up, whoever follows my guidance, there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. Okay. And those who disbelieve and deny our signs, again, plural of majesty, those will be companions of the fire and they will abide therein eternally. O children of Israel. So if you're not from Israel, uh, meaning like you're not from the children of Israel, uh, this doesn't pertain to you. Okay. So it's addressing these particular people. Remember my favor, which I have bestowed upon you and fulfilled my covenant upon you. And I will fulfill your covenant from me and be afraid of only me. And believe in what I have sent down, confirming that which is already with you and be not the first to disbelieve in it. And do not exchange my signs for a small price and fear only me. So here we have some golden nuggets. We have the nuggets of the children of Israel who were in a covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, I have fulfilled the covenant. Okay. And then it tells us or it gives us an insight that these people were afraid of something else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly states and be afraid of only me. 
So that must mean that there must have been some form of external pressures going on with the people that he's addressing. And, and he tells them to believe in what he has sent, confirming that which is already with you. So they had a message already. They had a, a contact with a messenger. They had a message that was given to them. And be not the first to disbelieve in it. Okay. So he's giving them a stern warning. Um, and do not exchange my signs for a small price. So what's the price? This worldly gain. Uh, and it's a warning not to exchange it. Don't hide. Don't conceal the information. Okay, uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on and says, do not and do not mix the truth with falsehood or conceal the truth while you know it. Okay, straight up. So if they're mixing truth with falsehood, now you have an answer to um, the question of what about the things that happened to the previous scriptures? That there was truth mixed with falsehood. And now it's going to corrupt things going forward. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to send another messenger. Uh, and he also has to send another message, okay? So, um, and establish prayer and give zakah and bow with those who bow in worship and obedience, okay? So establishing the prayer, extremely critical. Um, if you guys aren't upon your prayers, right now Ramadan is a beautiful time to just rekindle that. Uh, you can go to the Tarawih prayers, and if your schedule doesn't permit, just take a moment to just chill and and um in your personal reflections to catch up on your prayers and so on uh and give zakah so give into charity right one of the uh one of the five pillars uh do you order righteousness of the people and forget yourselves while you recite the scripture then will you not reason so here is a, a prime example of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving us a, a prime example of somebody who isn't leading by example Right. Are you out there trying to preach and you're out there trying to correct others when you yourself are not following uh, what was given to you and what you know to be true? And then he gives us a, a, a he poses the question, will you not reason? Meaning, like, don't you think you sound a little silly, you know, not in the presence of others, but you sound silly in the presence of God because he can see through the facade right you just if you really do any type of personal reflection you'll see um, what's up with that okay and seek help through patience and prayer and indeed it is difficult except for the humbly submissive to a law uh so he gives us the condition right it's not about getting financial gains it's not about being some uh person that's like famous or whatever rather uh this life uh there's a key to this life and the key to it is patience and prayer. And the way that you attain that type of patience and attain that type of uh, that type of prayer is to be humbly submissive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning the more that you follow his guidelines and to the best of your abilities, follow those guidelines, the more tranquility uh, he will instill in your heart. And it's a, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint, right? So there's going to be ebbs and flows and up and down and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? So just keep up the good work and don't beat yourself up when you're down rather just reflect on all the good things that you've done and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of the rest inshallah uh okay so um who are certainly that they will meet uh, who are certain that they will meet their lord and that they will return to him okay so if you are upon certainty that the day of judgment will come this whole realm of existence is going to be a lot easier for you O children of Israel, so back again addressing to the children of Israel, remember my favor that I have bestowed upon you and that I have preferred you over the worlds. Uh, and, and in brackets, this is you over uh, the other peoples. And fear a day when no soul will suffice for another soul at all, nor will intercession be accepted from it, nor will compensation be taken from it, nor will they be aided. Okay, so two things. Obviously, the children of Israel were favored by receiving a messenger and by receiving a message. Okay, and that's what uh, my personal reflection is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He favored them over all the world, uh, the people, over all the other peoples. Okay, it's not that all of a sudden uh, there is some type of um, advantage to being a children of uh, children of Israel. Rather, it was just an honor that was bestowed upon them at that time, which is fine. 
Um, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and fear a day when no soul will suffice for another soul. So guess what? You can't be responsible for anybody else. Um, you know, you can't try to barter or bargain, uh, nor will intercession be accepted from it, nor will compensation be taken from it, nor will they be aided. And here's the deal, dude. Why would why would you want to be held responsible for somebody else's wrongdoings? And you know, it's time to be accountable for yourself, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, in a sense, that uh, don't think that you're going to be able to call upon your mom and dad and be like, hey, help me out and this, that, and the third when you're an adult and you've hit all the criteria for being, you know, held accountable for an adult and you'll be tried as an adult, right? Okay. And recall when we saved you, i.e. your forefathers, from the people of Pharaoh who afflicted you with the worst torment, slaughtering your newborn sons and keeping your females alive. And in that was a great trial from your Lord. So again, he identifies this as a particular trial and a great trial at that. And uh, there was a, a period of time where it was incredibly difficult. However, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we saved you from your forefathers, from the people of Pharaoh. Okay. So uh, at the end of it, at the end of the tunnel, there was, uh, sal there was salvation and there was uh, saving. Okay. And that was specific for the people of that time. And recall when we parted the sea for you and saved you and drowned the people of Pharaoh while you were looking on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes credit for the miracle of parting of the sea. Naturally, we believe that. Um, we don't believe that prophets have these um, miraculous powers by themselves. Rather, uh, this is all done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, these prophets were just um, given this type of uh, these types of wonders to uh, either help with situations such as parting for the sea or proving themselves that they are indeed messengers. Okay. And recall when we make uh, uh, and recall when we made an appointment with Moses for 40 nights, then you took for worship the calf after him. So while Moses was departed, uh, you took a, a calf and worshiped it while you were wrongdoers. And remember, again, the condition was you can't associate any type of partnership. Uh, then we forgave you after that. So perhaps you would be grateful. So, again, people fell down. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them forgiveness. And again, uh, uh, you know, he's saying, you're, you're going to get up, you're going to fall, okay? But again, off forgiving, most forgiving, and he forgave them. And recall when we gave Moses the scripture and criterion that perhaps you would be guided, okay? So there was a scripture that was given. There was guidance that was given. There was criteria that was set forth for them. Our criteria is different than their criteria. Those were the, the people of Musa, and uh, we're the people of Muhammad, and recall when Moses said to his people, oh, my people, indeed, you have wronged yourselves by your taking the calf for worship. So repent to your creator and kill yourselves, i.e. the guilty among you. That is best for uh, that is best for all of you in the sight of your creator. Then he accepted your repentance. Indeed, he is the accept, uh, accept, uh, accepting of repentance and the merciful. Now, naturally, this is one of those things where um, you call for repentance. You, you invite people back to belief if they openly disbelieve and they persist in their ways and there is no other alternative. Right. Then you have the ability uh, to um, uh, approach them in a more threatening manner. Uh, but this is befitting to this particular event, meaning they were with a messenger, okay? And the messenger gave them the set of instructions on what to do. You really have no excuse at that point in time. Because remember, uh, if there was disagreements in tribal societies, they they would be at each other's throats. It wasn't just like, oh, let's start this whole, you know, systemic uh, systematic process and all this stuff. You have to be, you have to really reflect on what was happening at that time, okay? So it says the guilty among you, all right? Um, and recall when you said, oh, Moses, we will never believe you until we see a law outright. So the thunderbolt took you while you were looking on. Uh, again, you know, you're, 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 you have to imagine yourself walking with a messenger and seeing all the things that they have conducted and still, still being upon a path of disbelief. 
And this is, again, my own personal reflection. Um, this is why I think that there is an eternity to Hellfire, because there's people that no matter what, no matter what, they are going to disbelieve in the creator. And remember, the condition, the first condition of um, uh, the most important thing is to have that belief in the oneness of God. And no matter what is given to these people time and time again, they won't believe. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives other people the reward for eternity, it is equally befitting. Again, my own personal reflection, equally befitting that uh, the punishment is also uh, set for eternity because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have given these people a over, for eternity, he would have given them chances, and for eternity, they would have denied it. Okay, and this is the this is the issue. This is the issue. Okay, uh, and it says, and recall when we said to you, O Moses, we will never believe until we see a law outright. So the thunderbolt took you while you were looking on. Then we revived you after your death that perhaps you would be grateful. And we shaded you with clouds and sent down to you manna and quails, saying, eat from the good things with which we have provided you. And they have wronged us not, but they were only wronging themselves. So obviously you can't impact the lost panathala in any which way. Rather, um, you're, only, you're only wronging yourselves. Uh, back to the Quran. And for any non-Muslim that's watching, um, if you have any questions about Islam, uh, I'll be happy to uh, host you on the platform over here so we can we can get a dialogue going um, for the small amount of time that I have left. But uh, anyway, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So we left off on uh, number, we finished 57, and now we're back at, at, at 58. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And recall when we said, enter this city, which was Jerusalem, and eat from it wherever you will in ease and abundance and enter the gate bowing humbly and say, relieve us of our burdens, uh, i.e. our sins. We will then forgive your sins for you and we will increase the doers of good in goodness and reward. So as long as you're practicing good and you're on the path towards good, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase you in that. And naturally he is the forgiver of sins. Uh, but those who wronged changed those words to a statement other than that which had been said to them. So we sent down upon those who wronged a punishment, uh, which is the plague from the sky, because they were defiantly disobeying. Okay, so remember the, the thing that we discussed about earlier, the thing that we had mentioned earlier, that defiant, uh, defiantly disobedient, right? And it says, that they wronged and changed the words to a statement other than that which had been said. So you have another evidence and another claim that the historic scriptures, uh, uh, or excuse me, not the historic. Yeah, I can use the word historic. That's that's safe to say here. The previous scriptures probably better put is um, there's evidence of corruption. Okay, and the, the evidence of that, uh, or the, the consequence of that was um, a punishment, which was the plague. And recall when Moses prayed for water for his people, so we said, strike with your staff the stone. And there gushed forth from it 12 springs, and every people, which is the tribes, knew its watering place. Eat and drink from the provisions of Allah, and do not commit abuse on the earth, spreading corruption. Now, for all the people that are... Um, uh, very much so about uh, protecting the planet, environmental sustainability, uh, all these things. This is a uh, this is a decree for us in Islam that we can't utilize uh, resources in a, in a way that's abusive towards the planet because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala labels that as spreading corruption, right? So if you're abusing the planet, uh, then it is a very un-Islamic thing to do. So. Uh, great things that you could do is obviously if you see trash somewhere, pick it up, but try your best to not waste water. You know, the, the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to use minimal water for wudu. And you'd be really surprised. Um, you'd be really, really, really surprised just how little water you need to actually make wudu. As a matter of fact, uh, when I was just out with uh, friends, not but maybe about a month ago, uh, we were on our way to the masjid. And um, while we were on our way to the masjid, 
he pulled up to the masjid and subhanallah it was like completely locked up the lights were out and stuff like that we were just on our way to catch uh, maghrib salah and we must have just missed it um so we came a little bit later and we were like oh man we don't really have anything to make we'll do well in the cup holder was a unused uh like a, a cup of water okay and three of us three of us made wudu using that cup of water with the straw so there was a straw in there we took the little straw we pushed the top of the straw pressured the water right dropped it in our hands and we made wudu using that full wudu i'm talking like you know everything the whole shebang and it made me really reflect on like when i turn the faucet on to make wudu at home like obviously i keep it on a low setting but i was thinking to myself you know subhanallah i could probably even improve on that because again it's it's you can't you can't just be wasting resources like that you know um okay give me just one second guys i'm gonna crack open I had to crack open a window real quick just to let some a uh, cool breeze in uh for some reason in my office it just got really really hot all of a sudden okay so bismillah uh so don't spread corruption by abusing the earth okay uh and recall when you said oh moses we can never endure one kind of food so call upon your lord to bring forth for us from the earth its green herbs and its cucumbers and its garlic and its lentils and its onions moses said would you exchange what is better for what is less go into any settlement and indeed you will have what you have asked and they were covered with humiliation and poverty and return with anger from allah upon them that was because they repeatedly disbelieved in the signs of Allah and killed the prophets without uh, right. That was because they disobeyed and were habitually transgressing. Okay, so the people that lost their cool, that lost their patience, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala labeled them as habitual transgressors. So they have developed a habit of perpetually complaining. And um, uh, obviously, uh, they went astray. Uh, so much so to the point where uh, they even killed uh, prophets without right. Naturally, um, this is a, a grave, grave, grave error. All right. Indeed, those who believed and those who were Jews or Christians or Sabians before Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, those among them who believed in Allah in the last day and did righteousness will have their reward with their Lord and no fear will there be concerning them, nor will they grieve. Okay, so let's just take a moment to dissect this really quickly. It's not talking about um, the actual Judaism that you see today or the Christianity, the Trinitarian Christianity that you see today. It's talking about people that were submissive, meaning they were Muslim, but they the um, the times called uh, the, the the name change happened. There was no such thing as Christianity. There was no such thing as Judaism. There was only Islam until people had corrupted. The scriptures and people had corrupted the religions and uh they started labeling themselves as such okay either you were a muslim or you weren't right it was only until people started making these types of labels these doctrines these councils these churches these church fathers these this this that you know isa Islam did not come in and preach christianity isa Islam preached monotheism he preached islam but it was the islam of isa Islam. Musa Islam, he preached Islam. Dawood preached Islam. All these prophets, uh, Islam, preached Islam. Okay. So that verse, not to be confused with, you know, uh, some type of, um, you know, like all of a sudden Trinitarian Christians get a, a, a free golden ticket. You know, that, that that's not what the Quran is saying there. And recall when we took your covenant, O children of Israel, to abide by the Torah, and we raised over the mount saying, take what we have given you with determination and remember what is in it, that perhaps you may become righteous. Okay. So he's telling, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them, and remember, recall when we took your covenant. So there was an agreement that was made 
and um, take what we have given you with determination and remember what is in it that perhaps you may become righteous. Okay, so remember, he's telling, reflect, look back, think back. When you turn away after that, and if not for the favor of Allah upon you and his mercy, you would have been among the losers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided people because they, they actually uh, turned back, right? They reflected on that, okay? And you had already known about those who transgressed among you concerning the Sabbath, and we said to them, be apes despised. Now, whether or not that's a physical transformation or a metaphoric one, obviously I leave that up to scholarship. I'm not a scholar. And we made it uh, a deterrent punishment for those who were present and those who succeeded them and a lesson for those who fear Allah. And recall when Moses said to his people, indeed, Allah commands you to slaughter a cow. They said, do you take us in ridicule? He said, I seek refuge in Allah from being amongst the ignorant. And this is one of the one of the beautiful things about the Quran, you guys. When you see things like this, this is a dua and this is a prophetic dua, right? So when you're reading your own Quran at home, when you come across something like this, it's usually best practice to, to um, really make it personal by saying, um, Ya Allah, give me refuge from those that are ignorant and make me not of those that are ignorant. And you say, Amin on top of that, because this was uh, Musa's dua. Right. And we love we love all the prophets. So we respect them by repeating their dua, because not only are they mentioned in the Quran, so are you, you know, for a fact, this is a really strong dua. But really think about what's being said here. Right. You want protection from ignorance in every possible way um, from everything, your job, relationships, everything, like absolutely everything. Ignorance is is really a massive root of evil uh, when it comes to racism, when it comes to. Uh, depression when it comes to a lot of stuff, you guys, right? So um, ignorance is, is really important to uh, shed yourself of. They said, call upon your Lord to make clear to us what it is. Moses said, Allah says, it is a cow which is neither old nor virgin, but median between that. So that what you are command, so, so do what you are commanded. They said, call upon your Lord to show us what is her color. He said, he says, it is a yellow cow, bright in color, pleasing to the observers. Verse 70, they said, call upon your Lord to make clear to us what it is. Indeed, all cows look alike to us. And indeed, uh, we, if Allah wills, will be guided. He said, yes. Uh, he said, he says, it is a cow, uh, neither trained to plow the earth nor to irrigate the field, one free from fault with no spot upon her. They said, now you have come with the truth. So they slaughtered her, but they could hardly do it. And recall when you slew a man and disputed over it, but Allah was to, was to bring out that which you were concealing. So we said, strike him, the slain man, with part of it. Thus does Allah bring the dead to life, and he shows you his signs that you might reason. Then your hearts became hardened after that, being like stones or even harder. For indeed, there are stones for which rivers burst forth, and there are some of them that split open and water comes out. And there are some of them that fall down for fear of Allah, and Allah is not unaware of what you do. Do you covet the hope, O believers? So it's addressing believers now. So here's the thing. If you are not, uh, if you are not a, a person that believes, this is where you're only going to get a portional benefit of the Quran, right? So like, if you are a Muslim, this is now addressing you specifically. And this is one of the beauties of becoming a Muslim is now, now you get yet another portion of, um, of uh, knowledge and another portion of benefit uh, and beneficial advice from the Quran. Do you covet the hope, O believers, that you would believe for you while a party of them used to hear the words of Allah and then distort it? And it's referencing the Torah. And after they had understood it while uh, they were knowing. So here's the issue. They knew that they were distorting the Torah. They knew it. Right. And they were still doing it. And when they meet those who believe, they said, we have believed. But when they are alone with one another, they say, do you talk to them about what Allah has revealed to you so they can argue with you about it before your Lord? Then will you not reason? 
So imagine there's back talk going on and they don't want the truth to come out. And they're talking amongst one another. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing them in the Quran, you're, what are you doing? It's plain as day. You're, you're, you're not hiding anything from me. I'm the Almighty. And here you are doing the things that you're doing. But do they not know that Allah knows what they conceal and what they declare? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's in your heart, what's in your chest. He knows what's in your mind. Okay. You can't get away with stuff like this. And now it's it's obviously being documented by the angels on your shoulders. And now you even have a scriptural documentation after the Torah, right? And among them are unlettered ones who do not know the scripture, except indulgement in it, wishful thinking that they are only assuming. So to me, again, personal reflection, I'm not a scholar, but you have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clearly saying here that there's people that are very uneducated, um, they're, they have no knowledge, but whatever whatever they indulge in, okay? So somebody has a specialization on their field, but now all of a sudden they think that they're just some type of scholar and stuff like that. It's just not, not how things work, right? And it's wishful thinking, and they're only assuming. So all these things of scientists and stuff, I mean, heck, I was talking to a, um, I forget who I was talking to the other day, but uh, there was a gentleman on a platform, and he said, like, oh, we have like PhDs in physics and quantum mechanics and all this stuff. And even they don't know, right? They don't know the origin of the universe. And it boils down to, of course, they're not going to know. It, science is not going to tell you what the origin is. We, we know. We know that, it's, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the originator and that he was the creator. We, you don't need physics. You don't need any of these things. If you would just crack open the scripture and use your deductive and inductive reasoning, you would come to your conclusions if you use your reasoning faculties. So woe to those who write the scriptures with their own hands, then say this is from Allah in order to exchange it for a small price. Woe to them for what their hands have written and woe to them for what they earn. So here's the deal. <clears throat> you are caught. You were caught, and not only were you caught, but you willingly did this. Because remember, in the 76th verse, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, um, just to reflect back again, and when they meet those believers, they say, we have believed, but when they are alone with one another, they say, do you talk to them about what Allah has revealed to you so they can argue with you uh, before your Lord, then will you not reason? And excuse me, even 75 before that, just to add more con uh, just to add more context. It says, Do you covet that they would believe for you while a party of them used to hear the words of Allah and then distort it after they had understood it while they were knowing? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us they did it knowingly, knowingly. And then the Quran again affirms. Uh, so there's no shadow of a doubt. So woe to those who write the scriptures with their own hands and said that this is from Allah in order to exchange it for a small price. Woe to them for what their hands have written and woe to them for what they have earned. There's no question whatsoever. If anybody ever asks you about previous scriptures, the Quran confirms that they have indeed been corrupted. And when they say, uh, excuse me, and they say, never will the fire touch us except for a few numbered days. Say, have you taken a covenant with Allah? For Allah will never break his covenant. Or do you say about Allah that which you do not know? Plain and simple, man. They're just talking hollow. If somebody tells you, oh, I've got a, you know, in this scene, I talk to people that are saying that they're communicating with God and all this other stuff. And, you know, they're just sounding like a nutty bunch. They, they don't have access to the unseen. That's not how this works. If, if God talked to every single one of us, we would all, there would be chaos, absolute, absolute chaos. So thank God, alhamdulillah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us these messengers, sent us these clear messages and gave us the clear Quran so that way that we don't have these types of problems. Uh, yes, on the contrary, whoever earns, this is verse 81, on the contrary, uh, whoever earns evil and his sin has encompassed him, those are the companions of the fire. They will abide therein eternally. 
But they who believe and do righteous deeds, those are the companions of paradise. They will abide therein eternally. So again, system of reward, system of punishment, right? Basic down to the root level. Okay. And recall, uh, and recall when we took the covenant from the children of Israel, in joining upon them, do not worship except the law, and to parents do good, and to relatives, orphans, and the needy, and speak to people good words and establish prayer and give zakah. Then you turned away, except a few of you, and you were refusing. So here's the deal. If you're a person that values uh, parents, doing good to, to the elderly, doing good to your parents, doing good to relatives, treating orphans with respect, taking care of the need, then Islam is for you. It, plain as day. You want to get a glimpse as to what a, 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 a worshiping righteous Muslim does. They take care of the planet. They take care of their relatives. They take care of the parents. They take care of the needy. They take care of the orphans. And they speak good to people. They speak good to people. Be kind to people. Right? And establish prayer and give zakat. Zakat is charity for anybody that's a non-Arab uh, speaker. Uh, then you turn away, except a few of you, and you are refusing. Okay? And recall when we took your covenant saying, do not shed uh, your, i.e. each other's blood or evict one another from your homes. Then you acknowledge this while you were witnessing. Then you are those same ones who are killing one another and evicting a party of your people from their homes, cooperating against them in sin and aggression. And if they come to you as captives, you ransom them. Although your eviction was forbidden to you, so do you believe in part of the scripture and disbelieve in part? Then what is the recompense for those who do that among you except disgrace and worldly life? And on the day of resurrection, they will be sent back to the severest of punishment. And Allah is not unaware of what you do. You know, subhanAllah, it's just, again, you're getting stern warnings. You're getting stern warnings of being nice to one another, not to shed any type of blood, not to evict people from homes, not to cause any type of corruption, not to cause chaos, uh, not to cause any of this, you know, for the purposes of like greed, land, all these things. I mean, it's just, it's as plain as day. Those are the ones who have, this is verse 86, those are the ones who have uh, bought the life of this world in exchange for the hereafter. So the punishment will not be lightened for them, nor will they be aided. I mean, even as you read some of these verses of what's happening today, not just the whole situation with uh, Palestine, but from all, all areas of the world, all types of displacement, all types of evictions, okay? Whether they be um, by force or whether they be by scheme. And what do I mean by scheme? Uh, you have you have uh, organizations and companies right now that are taking advantage of people's financial situations. And I'm not going to get into the subject of riba, which is usury in Islam. It'll be covered as we kind of just go through the literature and read through the Quran. But usury is impermissible in Islam. Dealing with interest is impermissible in Islam. And all these organizations, the way that they plot, the way that they scheme, the way that they um, price housings, all these other things... This is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning us not to do. So you don't necessarily have to ruin someone life, uh, someone's life by going and threatening them physically. You can do it by creating a uh, an economic landscape where they're just buried and they're enslaved in a manner that's just it's just terrible, right? So these are the ones who have bought the life of this world in exchange for the hereafter. So these people that are acting this way. And you see them and they're super rich and they've got all these mansions and private jets and this, this, and that. Now, I'm not saying that the, all of them are disbelievers, but I'm saying a great majority of them are. There are many wealthy people that are very, uh, very, very extremely well off, both historically and in a present day, that can be very, uh, very much so believing people that are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they've earned their income in a halal way, meaning in a permissible way. But it's far and few in between, guys. All the things that we see today. Uh, again, I don't want to speak in absolutes. Most of the things that we see today, um, this is not halal money. Rather, it's in a form of usury and system grinding and stuff like that. So, okay. Um, uh, carrying on. 
So these people traded the hereafter for this world, right? So don't be don't be um, drawn into the glitz and glam of things, uh, because their punishment's not going to be lightened, nor will they be aided, right? And we did certainly give Moses the scripture, which was the Torah, and followed up after him with messengers. And we gave Jesus, the son of Mary. Notice how it says son of Mary. It doesn't say God's son or anything like that, but rather Jesus' lineage is coming from a matriarchal standpoint. Because from an Islamic perspective, he doesn't have a father, right? He doesn't have a male. He, there's no male counterpart. Uh, we believe in the miraculous birth of Jesus. Sam. We honor him. We love him. Um, you know, we cherish him. We just don't elevate him to a status of divine. Uh, clear proofs. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reread that. And we gave Jesus, the son of Mary, clear proofs and supported him with the pure spirit, which was uh, Jibril or, or uh, angel Gabriel. But it is not that every time a messenger came to you, O children of Israel, with what your souls did not desire, you were arrogant. So here's the thing. Another characteristic of arrogance, another highlighting of arrogance. So, so far, the consistent theme about people that are in a state of disbelief is perpetual arrogance. And a party of messengers you denied and another party you killed. Wow. So there was multiple messengers that was sent over. A party was denied and the other party was um, basically unalive. And they said, our hearts are wrapped. But in fact, Allah has cursed them for their disbelief and so little is it that they believe? So again, remember, the curse is a consequence. So when somebody is still entwined in that type of arrogance, the consequence is the closing of the heart, okay? And then when, when there uh, came to them a book, the Quran from Allah, confirming that which was, uh, which was with them. Although before they used to pray for the victory against those who disbelieved, but then when there came to them that which they recognized, they disbelieved in it. So the curse of Allah will be upon the disbelievers. And again, it's referencing those particular people, the children of Israel. It's talking about those particular people. So um, how is this applicable, right? This is applicable when in today's times, if you are somebody who's uh, just consumed by arrogance and you're perpetually choosing to disbelieve, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's going to keep giving you chances and giving you chances, but your heart is going to just slowly keep closing and closing and closing until it's completely sealed. And it'll be that much more difficult to turn back. Okay. So um, again, the scriptures that it was confirming is not the gospels. This is not the gospel of Mark, Matthew, Luke, or John. This is the Injil. This is the Torah, which they themselves had and they kept to themselves. Okay. So um, that's, that's the idea here. How wretched is that for which they sold themselves? And they would disbelieve in what Allah has revealed through their outrage that Allah would send down his favor upon whom he wills for among his servants. So they, re so they returned having earned wrath upon wrath. And for the disbelievers is a humiliating punishment. Again, Distance yourself as much as possible from that. And the way that you do that is by shedding ignorance and um, uh, shedding yourself of that arrogance. And when it is said to them, believe in what Allah has revealed, they say, we believe only in what was revealed to us. So again, they're taking that arrogant standpoint and they disbelieve in what came after it. While it is the truth confirming that which is with them. Say, then why did you kill the prophets of Allah before if you are indeed believers? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is posing a wonderful question there. Um, why would you conduct something like that unless you had something to hide? You don't just go off and, you know, do these heinous crimes unless you're trying to hide something. So they were clearly trying to hide something. That was their motive. Their motive was worldly gain. Their motive was concealment. And, and trying to maintain status and uh, getting to a particular position in this world. And they sacrificed it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they sacrificed their hereafter uh, for, um, for a, a, a miser, miserly, uh, miserly game. Okay, next it says, and Moses had certainly brought you clear proofs. Then you took the calf in worship after that while you were wrongdoers. 93, and recall when we took your covenant and raised over you the mount, saying, take what we have given you with determination and listen. 
They said, instead, we heard and we hear and disobey and their hearts absorb the worship of the calf because of their disbelief. Say how wretched is that which your faith enjoins upon you if you should be believers. Say, O Muhammad, وسلم, if the home of the hereafter with Allah is for you alone and not the other people, then wish for your death if you should be truthful. So here's the challenge to them. You know what? You really think that you're upon truth? Come meet me. Come meet me is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. You really, you're so confident about your, about your belief, meaning ironically, or should I say oppositely, disbelief? then come do what you got to do and come meet me. Why not just advance the time? If you're so confident, come meet me because I'm waiting. And that was a challenge to them. But never will they wish for it, ever. Look at how strong of a, of a statement that is. But never will they wish for it, ever, because of what their hands have put forth and Allah is knowing of the wrongdoers. So they know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, obviously. So it reminds me of that old saying, uh, they know, we know, they know that we know, we know that they know that we know, but they're still persisting in their ways. It's like, that's just how it is. Okay. So, uh, carrying on. <clears throat> but never will they wish for it ever because of what their hands have put forth and Allah uh, is knowing of the wrongdoers. And you will surely find them the most greedy of people for life even more than those who associate others with Allah. One of them wishes that he could be granted life a thousand years, but it would not remove him in the least from the coming punishment that he should be granted life, and Allah is seeing of what they do. So naturally, naturally, uh, these people are trying to, they are trying to hoard up a, a great deal of wealth, a great deal of status, uh, a great deal of recognition or whatever they, whatever ex exactly it is that they're trying to hold up over the backs of others, not caring what happens to them, not caring about how they're conducting themselves in the slightest. And then their whole goal is trying to stay alive forever. And if you ever, um, if you ever really take a moment to reflect upon modern medicine, really uh, what it is, is it's a quest for immortality. I mean, so much so to the point where people are trying to, um, people are trying to like cryogenically freeze themselves in order to preserve uh, what they've obtained in this world. And it's not a stretch to think that way, right? Um, that these people really are seeking for thousands of thousands of years and stuff like that. It's just, it's really, really strange. Um, okay. So, uh, let's, let's move on to, um, the next one, uh, say whoever is an enemy to Gabriel, it is none, but, uh, it is none, but he who has brought it, which is the Quran down upon your heart, O Muhammad. So, uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, just to clarify, because there's a lot of brackets being uh, being read. Anybody that is an enemy to Jibreel is none but the person who is um, against the Prophet by permission of Allah, confirming that which was before it as a guidance and good tithing for the believers. Whoever is an enemy to Allah and his angels and his messengers and Gabriel and Michael angels, Jibreel and Mikhail, then indeed Allah is an enemy to the disbelievers. And notice how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala phrases it here. Um, he Notice how he's phrasing it here. Uh, he's phrasing it as, um, whoever's a, he's phrasing it here as whoever's an enemy to Allah and his uh, angels and his messengers. So all of them. Um, it is... Uh, it is really, really something else when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is honoring all of his uh, all of his messengers previously. So all of these messengers were sent with the exact same message. Um, okay, 
I did catch one of the messages in the chat. So let me just take a pause here. Uh, why am I not reading the chat? Sorry, I was trying to get through the first juz. <laughs> okay. Uh, what did I miss? Let me see. I definitely had to, I had to remove that one guy. He was just strange. Uh... Um, um, I mean, you're welcome to, dude. You're, you're totally welcome to, but let me just get through this juz. I've got maybe, oh, what do I have? I'm not too far off. I'm at, um, I'm at 100 and I got to get to one, 141. So you're welcome to, I mean, the link is pinned. Anybody that's non-Muslim is welcome to join. Um, okay. So Allah subhanahu wa says, for whoever is an enemy to Allah and his angels and his messengers and, and Gabriel and Michael, then indeed Allah is an enemy to the disbelievers. And we have certainly revealed to you verses which are clear proofs and no one would deny them except the defiantly disobedient. So again, it's talking about people that are so overly consumed with their defiance, overly consumed with arrogance, um, that these are the ones that are uh, th that are the ones that are in denial and that are choosing to be in this particular state. It is not true that every time they took a covenant, a party. Uh, is it not true? Excuse me. Is it not true that every time they took a covenant, a party of them threw it away? But in fact, most of them do not believe. And when a messenger from Allah came to them confirming that which was with them, a party of those who had been given the scripture through the scripture of Allah, which is the Torah, behind their back as if they did not know what it contained. But remember what was given to us previously. What was given to us previously was that they knowingly changed the scriptures and they knew what it contained. And they followed instead what the devils had recited during the reign of Solomon. It was not Solomon who disbelieved, but the devils disbelieved, teaching people magic that they that which was revealed to the two angels at Babylon, Harut, uh, Harut and Marut. But they, i.e. the two angels, do not teach anyone unless they say, we are a trial, so do not disbelieve by practicing magic. So obviously, Seher, uh, any other types of fortune telling and stuff like that, strictly forbidden in Islam. Um, as a matter of fact, there's, uh, uh, I believe there's some knowledge in that people that visit these places are marked by jinn. So um, they know when they, when you're somebody that goes to these places, these um, fortune tellers and stuff like that. So just stay away from that uh, by every, which means whether, obviously, whether you're Muslim and whether you're non-Muslim, uh, you know, we invite you to Islam, which is better than going to these fortune tellers. And yet they learn from them what by which they cause separation between a man and his wife. And to my understanding, um, this is uh, a psychology. So roots of manipulation, how to use certain emotions and stuff like that. And they do not harm anyone through it except by permission of Allah. So again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate controller. But here's the deal. If does magic exist? Absolutely. We believe in that. Does the unseen world exist? Absolutely. We believe in that. Does Allah give permission for these things to happen? Absolutely. There is not a single thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have dominion over, including uh, all the good and the bad things that happen in this world. He creates the landscape, the possibilities for these things to happen. Uh, and they, i.e. people, learn what harms them and does not benefit them. So everything that you're going to learn from these angels, Harut and Marut, uh, it's not going to benefit you in the slightest, but they, i.e. the children of Israel, certainly know that whoever purchased it, which was the magic, would not have in hereafter any share. So boom, clear cut, stamp, nothing you could say on top of it. You're, you have purely sacrificed your hereafter for this world. Uh, and it continues. And wretched is that for which they sold themselves if they only knew. And if they had believed and feared Allah, then the reward from Allah would have been far better if they only knew. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most giving, the most merciful. Um, he's the source of bounty. Oh, you who have believed. So now that's addressing the people who have believed. Say not to Allah's messenger, ra'inna, but say unzurna, and listen. And for the disbelievers is a painful punishment. So the word ra'inna 
in Arabic literally means consider us, i.e. give us time to hear you and listen to us. The Jews used to use the same word with the meaning of uh, as an insult. Therefore, the believers were ordered to avoid this expression and to use instead the word undurna, which is wait for us so that we may understand. Um, okay, so we have a conduct or a way that that we have to we have to conduct ourselves uh, when dealing with people, um, especially prophets. That's why we say things like alayhi wasalam and sallallahu alayhi wasalam and stuff like that. And if there was anything even remotely insulting to the prophet, wasalam, you know, it's it's an act of disbelief to be talking that way about the prophet. It's actually even to have a to have a thought of something negative on the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, uh, you know, an act of disbelief. It's, it's going to head towards disbelief. So, you know, when you hear things that are like controversial or something like that, the Prophet Sallallahu was a perfect character, perfect example for mankind. To think that he did something bad or he had any bad intentions or anything like that, this is, this is not good. This is extremely un-Islamic because a prophet of, it's ill-befitting of a prophet of God to be that way. Any prophet. That's why when you hear things in the Bible about, you know, uh, certain prophets having, you know, explicit relations with their daughters or drinking or this, that this is not how we function in Islam, period. These are honorable people that have been elevated and chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we don't think ill of any of the messengers. So neither those who disbelieve from the prophet, uh, excuse me, neither those uh, who disbelieve from the people of the scripture, i.e. the Jews and the Christians, nor the polytheists, wish that any good should be sent down to you from your Lord. But Allah selects for his mercy whom he wills, and Allah is the possessor of great bounty. We do not abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten, except that we bring forth one better than it or similar to it. Do you not know that Allah is over all things competent? Now, this is a wonderful point because um, there's abrogations in the Quran. Obviously, we have abrogations for things like drinking. Right? It came the, the the prohibition of drinking was in stages, and obviously something better came forth. Right, first there was a prohibition of you can't show up to prayer while intoxicated. Then it, eventually it turned out to be completely abrogated to you cannot drink. Period. Right, you cannot have any type of intoxicants. So it's not saying that it, you know Allah subhanahu wa taala is like changing his mind. Rather, it's an attestation to. Um, the further miraculous nature of the Quran, because it was revealed in stages over the course of 23 years, that um, it needed to be practical for the people. Uh, if anybody's dealt with anybody that is dealing with some type of severe addiction, if you were to take that addiction away, uh, it could be life threatening for them. Okay. I mean, they could pass away. So the idea now is that um, this is one of the beauties and, again, the mercies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of things being revealed in stages. Uh, do you not know that Allah, to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth and that you have not, besides Allah, any protector or any helper? And you notice that it's a sequential, um, a sequential form of questioning, right? So you, people should be reflecting on this stuff, right? Reflect on this, that all dominion belongs to him. And if you are at war with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's just you just sound ridiculous. You know what I mean? It's just silly. Uh, or uh, 108 goes on and says, or do you intend to ask your messenger or Moses was asked for, or, or do you or do you intend to ask your messenger as Moses was asked before? And whoever exchanges faith for disbelief has certainly strayed from the soundness of the way. Many of the people of the scripture wish they could turn you back to disbelief after you have disbelieved out of envy from themselves, even after the truth has become clear to them. Okay, so now we have the second characteristic. Uh, oh, actually, not it's probably the third characteristic. The first one, I think, was arrogance. Uh, then it was uh, being defiantly disobedient, so defiance, okay, and persistently defiant. Now, uh, another characteristic that's highlighted is envy. Okay, so the envy after the truth has become clear to them. So these people visibly see it, they actively deny it, and now they are perpetually envious on top of that. And it's just like, okay, so stay away from stuff like that. Stay away from 
seeing the truth for truth and then trying to deny it and then being envious over somebody else when they have it. You know what I mean? So pardon and overlook until Allah delivers his command. Indeed, Allah is over all things competent. And establish prayer and give zakah. And whatever good you put forward for yourselves, you will find it with Allah. Indeed, Allah of what you do is, indeed Allah of what you do is seeing. And uh, they say, none will enter paradise except one who is a Jew or a Christian. That is merely their wishful thinking. Say, produce your proof if you should be truthful. And you know, subhanAllah, you know, 1400 years ago, here's this claim. The claim is that you're not going to enter paradise if you're not a Jew or a Christian, right? What is the, what is the biggest Christian argument today? That you have no guarantee of paradise and, I, and I'm good to go. Because, uh, billah, you know, Jesus died for my sins. Yeah, subhanAllah, man, you know, if you just, if they were just to pick up the scripture sincerely, they would just see, and they, if they were to reflect and wonder how is it that a, a man 1400 years ago, alayhi salatu salam, would be saying these things, and it's just literally coming true right in front of their eyes. Yes, on the contrary, whoever submits his face, i.e. self, in Islam to Allah, while being a doer of good, will have his reward with his Lord. And no fear will be there, uh, excuse me, and no fear will there be concerning them, nor will they grieve. So here is, here is the answer. The answer is you as a Muslim are the ones that have the guarantee. But there's a condition. There's a condition to the guarantee. The condition is you have to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while being a doer of good. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to test you. You can't just be like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm a Muslim, so I'm good. Otherwise, you're going to fall into the same problem that the Christians fall into today. They're saying, no problem. Jesus died for my sins. I can go drink. I can go do this. I can go do that. I can go blah, 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 but I'm good. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to hold yourself to account. You have to be good. Be good internally and externally. And what determines being good? Who determines being good? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? Follow the guidelines that were given uh, in the Quran al -Karim. Okay, uh, 113, almost done through the first Jews, guys. The, the Jews say the Christians have nothing true to stand on, and the Christians say the Jews have nothing to stand on, although they both recite the scripture. <laughs> so they're at odds with one another. Thus do those who know not, for example, the polytheists speak the same as their words. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying the Christians and the Jews and the polytheists, they're no different in their knowledge of the truth on how to best get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and then he continues, uh, but Allah will judge between them on the day of resurrection concerning that over which they used to differ. Okay, so obviously the Jewish scripture is different than the Christian scripture is different than the polytheist viewpoint. Okay, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be the judge. And who are more unjust than those who prevent the name of Allah from being mentioned, i.e. praised, in his mosques and strive towards their destruction? And again, uh, subhanAllah, like all the things that are happening today, you know, I saw a video a little bit earlier before I started this stream. Uh, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, bless our brothers and sisters in Gaza and, and all the oppressed around the world. Ameen. Uh, they're praying in the rubble. They're doing tarawih prayer uh, on the in like the rubbles of Masajid, but their voices, um, subhanAllah, are just loud and clear and their spirits are high and, you know, um, Allah protect them. And those who are, uh, and those who are more unjust than those who prevent the name of Allah from being mentioned, praised in his mosques and strive towards the destruction. It is not for them to enter them except in fear. For them in this world is disgrace and they will have in the hereafter a great punishment. And to Allah belongs the East and the West. So wherever you might turn there is the face of Allah. Indeed, Allah is all-encompassing and all-knowing. They say Allah has taken a son, exalted is he. Rather to him belong whatever is in the heavens and the earth. All are devoutly obedient to him. Originator of the heavens and the earth, when he decrees a matter, he only says to it, be, and it is. And here's the thing. It's kun fayakun, right? We don't we don't believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs any type of intermediary. We don't believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is deficient in any way. It's 
It's simply by his command, by his word, and uh, it happens. Those who do not know say, why does Allah not speak to us? And there come to us a sign. Thus spoke those before them, like their words, their heart resemble each other. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you the type of person that's looking for additional proof. He's giving you what is the condition of, of within their heart. It's, it hasn't changed. It, historically, it has not changed from the same person from, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. And yet the signs are the same. The, the monotheism is the same. So imagine just how stubborn the human being is. We have shown clearly the signs to people who are certain in faith. Indeed, we have sent you, O Muhammad, with the truth as a bringer of good tidings and a warner, and you will not be asked about the companions of hellfire. And never will the Jews and the Christians approve of you until you follow their religion. Say, indeed, the guidance of Allah is the only guidance. If you were to follow their desires after what has come to you of knowledge, you would have against Allah no protector or helper. Those to whom we have given the book recite it with its true recital. They are the ones who believe in it. And whoever disbelieves in it, it is they who are the losers. O children of Israel, remember my favor which I have bestowed upon you and that I preferred you over the world's. And fear a day when no soul will suffice for another soul at all, and no compensation will be accepted from it, nor will any intercession benefit it, nor will they be aided. And this is the second time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it, almost like it's being sandwiched. So anything that's that's mentioned multiple times in the Quran, pay close attention to that. And mention, O oh Muhammad, when Abraham uh, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when Abraham alayhi salam tried by his uh, was tried by his Lord with words, and he fulfilled them. Allah said, "Indeed, I will make you a leader for the people." Abraham uh, alayhi salam said, "And of my descendants, Allah said, my covenant does not include the wrongdoers." And mention when we made the house, which was the Kaaba, a place of return for the people and a place of security. And take, O believers, from the standing place of Abraham, a place of prayer. And we charged Abraham and Ismail, saying, Purify my house for those who perform tawaf, which is the circling around, and those who are staying there for worship, and those who bow and prostrate in prayer. And mention when Ibrahim, uh, when Abraham said, My Lord, make this a secure city and provide its people with fruits. Whoever of them believes in Allah in the last day, Allah said, and whoever disbelieves, I will grant him enjoyment for a little. Then I will force him to the punishment of the fire and wretches the destination. And wallahi, I've been to Umrah, alhamdulillah, I've been to Umrah several times. Wallahi, if inshallah, if you guys have not been, I, I make dua for you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invites you to his home um, and to bear witness uh, the strength of a prophetic dua because when you leave that place your heart will yearn immediately to go back immediately and this is by the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the dua made by uh, Ibrahim alayhi wallahi I, I I swear by God till this day I get shivers here and uh, you guys can't see that but I, I've got my literally I cannot wait to go back inshallah Okay, uh, almost done with the with the juz, you guys. Just another uh, page and a half left. And mention when Abraham was raising the foundation of the house, and with him Ismail, saying, "Our Lord, accept this from us. Indeed, you are the hearing, the knowing. Our Lord, make us Muslims." And again, he he these are prophetic du'a. So please, when you hear these things, reflect on it and 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 say. It, in a sense, to what's relative to ha happening in your life. Our Lord, accept this from us. Indeed, you are the hearing, the knowing. If you're doing something right now for work or your parents or charity or what have you, make that dua for yourself. Our Lord, make us Muslims in submission to you and from our descendants, a Muslim nation in submission to you and show us our rights of worship and accept our repentance. Indeed, you are the accepting of repentance, the merciful. Amen. Our Lord, and send among them a messenger from themselves who will recite to them your verses. 
and teach them the book and wisdom and purify them. Indeed, you are the exalted in might, uh, the wise. So for something like this, this type of a dua, uh, you can say something like, Our Lord, uh, my, uh, Ya Rabbi, or my Lord, uh, please make me um, closer to the message that the messenger has delivered and uh, let uh, the recited verses open up my heart and soften my heart. Things like that. You know what I mean? Really personalize it so that you can benefit from it, inshallah. Um, and, the, and who would be averse to the religion of Abraham except one who makes a fool of himself? And we had chosen him in this world, and indeed he, and indeed he in the hereafter will be among the righteous. When his Lord said to him, submit, he said, I have submitted in Islam to the Lord of the worlds. And Abraham instructed his sons to do the same. And so did Jacob, saying, O oh, my sons, indeed, Allah has chosen for you this religion. So do not die except while you are Muslims. Or were you witnesses when death approached Jacob, when he said to his sons, what will you worship after me? They said, we will worship your God and the God of your fathers, Abraham and Ismail and Ishaq. One God, and we are Muslims in submission to him. That was a nation which has passed on and it will have the consequence of what it earned. And you will have what you have earned and you will not be asked about what they used to do. They said, be Jews or Christians, so you will be guided. Say, rather we follow the religion of Abraham, inclining towards truth, and he was not of the polytheists. So here you have the, the Quranic position. If a Christian approaches you and says, come on over to Christianity, just say, no, man, I follow the religion of Abraham, and you should be too. He wasn't a polytheist. I'm inclining towards truth. This is the Quranic position. Say, O believers, we have believed in Allah. So this is specifically addressing the believers. If you're a Muslim or if you're someone that believes in, in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the oneness of God, this is now for you. Say, O believers, we have believed in Allah and what, what has been revealed to us and what has been revealed to Abraham and Ismail and Ishaq and, and Jacob and the descendants and what was given to Moses and Jesus and what was given to the prophets from their Lord we make no distinction between any of them, and we are Muslims in submission to him. A couple key takeaways. One, obviously, we believe in all of the messengers, alayhi salam, with the Prophet, alayhi salam, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi salam, being the last messenger and the final messenger, the seal. And we make no distinction. No distinction. They're like brothers. There's no, oh, this prophet is greater than this prophet. No. They're all no distinction. If you go, if you make a distinction, you're going against the Quran. You heard it yourself. Next, they were all in submission. They were all Muslim. They were all in submission to one God. All of them. Okay? Period. So if they believe, if they believe in the same as you believe in, then they have been rightly guided. But if they turn away, they are only in dissension. And Allah will be sufficient for you against them, and He is the hearing and knowing. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, and in these uh, final two or three verses, as we conclude this juz, inshallah, um, and say, and say, ours is the religion of Allah. And who is better than Allah in ordaining religion? AKA, ours is the religion of God, and who is better than God in ordaining religion? And we are worshipers of Him. Say, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do you argue with us about Allah while he is our Lord and your Lord? For us are our deeds and for you are your deeds. And we are sincere in deed and intention to him. Or do you say that Abraham and Ismail and Ishaq and Jacob and the descendants were Jews or Christians? Say, are you more knowing or is Allah? And who is more unjust than one who conceals a testimony? He has from Allah. And Allah is not unaware of what you do. What is a nation which has passed on? Uh, excuse me. That is a nation which has passed on. It will have the consequence of what it earned. And you will have what you earned. And you will not be asked about what they used to do. So here's the deal. They're long gone. They're, they're what happened with them is sealed, set, and consequence is not necessarily a bad word. Consequence is just a, um, 
think of it like action reaction. You can have a positive consequence, you can have a negative consequence, okay? So their reward and what they have earned, whether it be certain nations are gonna receive punishment, certain nations are gonna receive reward, right? It's it's between uh, them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, AKA we're not the ones to judge. What's more important and where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shifts our focus is ourselves, okay? We can read and learn about these folks but we have to see how we're practically applying it to us. So Barakallahu Fiqh, that's the end of this juz. Um, inshallah, I'll try to, you know, uh, pop back on uh, every night for the next uh, 30 nights of Ramadan for this stuff. So um, I see I have Rob here as a guest. So, uh, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of you guys for being patient with me. I'm not the best reader. And again, these are all just my own personal reflections. Um, I welcome any non-Muslims to come up and we can have a dialogue. Again, it's not a debate, um, but I'm, I'm happy to uh, be as, as gracious of a host as possible. And, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your fast and elevate you during this Ramadan, inshallah.